Austin and Islamic at NYU. I am also the director of Ottoman and Turkish studies at NYU, where we organize events for, with scholars from different uh, disciplinary backgrounds to talk, discuss anything and everything about Ottoman, post-Ottoman world, which is very broadly construed in our minds. Uh, today's event, however, is um, co-sponsored, co-organized between Ottoman and Turkish Studies Initiative and Iranian Studies Initiative, which is directed by my dear colleague Ali Mirsapasi. And before we start, I would like to mention several upcoming events that we are organizing, and you can find the further information in the, ch in the chat uh, to register for these events. And then I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. But before that, uh, Ottoman and Turkey Studies Initiative's next event will take place uh, on October 20th, which is next Thursday. And it is going to be an in-person, uh, it, it is going to be a hybrid event where we are going to meet in person, but also those of you who cannot attend, you can join us via Zoom. And the event is titled Komidas uh, Ustigukas, the post-Ottoman musical worlds of the Armenian diaspora. And we are going to have Professor Silvia Alajaji and Professor Elliot Bates with us to discuss Armenian music in the context of Ottoman and post-Ottoman world. Um, also, we have an event scheduled for November 3rd, organized by Iranian Studies Initiative. And the, the event is titled Violence and Care, the Basij and the Disabled Afghan Foreign Fighters in Iran. You can also find the link to register for this event on the chat. And for this event, we are going to have Ahmed Moradi uh, and also Aran Keshavarzian from NYU's Middle Eastern Studies uh, Department. And uh, last but not least, we have another event that is uh, organized by Iranian Studies Initiative to be held on December 8th. And it is going to be a book talk uh, by uh, Gregor Brev and uh, his book is titled Petroleum and the Progress in Iran, Oil Development and the Cold War. In addition to these three events, the Ottoman and Turkish Studies uh, Initiative has th two more events that I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to burden you with more information, but you can look at our website, otsnyu.com. You can also find information on our social media accounts, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. So now I'm going to move with introducing today's event. And today we have three uh, great scholars with us uh, for a panel or for a discussion. And the title of the event is Petitions and Petitioning in Iranian and Ottoman Constitutionalism. And with us, we have Nader Sohrabi. Nader Sohrabi is at Free University Berlin, and he is a researcher of history and sociology. And his research focuses on the Ottoman Empire and Iran, comparatively and otherwise. His last project was on the 1909 Adana massacres in the aftermath of the Young Turk Revolution. And his current project focuses on the meaning and transformation of petitioning during the constitutional revolution in Iran. We also with us have Yuval Ben Basad. Uh, professor Basad is an associate professor at the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at the University of Haifa. Uh, professor Ben Basad received his PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on Ottoman petitions, Ottoman maps, greater Syria in the 19th century, the rural population of Palestine and the early Jewish Arab conflict, uh, and the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. Ben Basad is the author of Petitioning the Sultan, Protest and Justice in Late Ottoman Palestine. And of course, I'm not going to list uh, every single publication by our scholars, but this is just one of them. And we also have with us Sarpil uh, Atamas. Uh, and uh, Sarpil is going to be the discussant uh, for the for the co conversation. Thank you, Sarpil. It's a pleasure to have you here. Sarpil is an associate professor in the Department of History at California State University, Sacramento. She received her PhD at the University of Arizona in Modern Middle East and Comparative Women's History. Her research focuses on early 20th century Turkey and Iran with particular emphasis on women, constitutionalism, nation building, modernization, and Turkish-Iranian interactions. 
I'm also I'm going to moderate the Q and A section at the end, and I will mention the format for that. But when you have questions, please use the chat function or send me a message if you would like me to read your questions on your behalf. And now the floor is yours, and our speakers are going to have no more than fifteen minutes. And after that, we are going to open the floor to uh, Q and A. Thank you again, and welcome. Okay. Thank you, Aisha, and uh, thank you, everybody, for um, attending this event and for um, inviting me to talk here. Uh, many years ago, as a student in Chicago, in one of Holly, Holly Schister's classes, we read another's book, and uh, I'm really happy I have a chance now to talk uh, along him today. Um, the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 uh, contributed to a dramatic transformation of the time-honored Ottoman petitioning system, which existed for hundreds of years. Uh, petition, petitioning now became a way to demand civil, political, and constitutional rights. The reinstatement of parliamentary life, the enactment of the postponed 1876 con constitution, the lifting of the ban on, the, on free press and political activity, and the demise of the notorious Hamidian regime all brought about major political, societal, and legal changes, which were also reflected in petition. As seen in a study I conducted on petitions from Greater Syria submitted during this period. Yet, it wasn't a complete break with the previous petitioning system. Rather, the changes built on the subject's growing awareness of the procedural modes of the reforms in the late Tanzimat and Hamidian periods and their rights as, as subjects who increasing, increasingly acted and were also treated as citizens of a modern state. After the revolution in July 1908, the question of who would address petitions under the new circumstances became topical. Up to the failed counter-revolution in the spring of 1909, which was driven by conservative circles and eventually led to Abdul Hamid's final dethronement, there was a short period of confusion and hesitation in petitions, and in fact, not many changes are visible. During this interim period, petitioners were very careful not to manifest disrespect toward the Sultan or express any opinions or statements that might put them in danger if the revolution failed. Thus, they refrained from mentioning the notorious and feared Sultan directly when addressing their petitions to the office of the Grand Vizier, who usually handled petitions in the name of the Sultan or to other Ottoman institutions or entities. Those self-imposed strictures were drastically abandoned when it became clear that Abdul Hamid had been dethroned. At this point in the spring of 1909, his long reign was immediately and really overnight, we see this change, was immediately described in petitions in the darkest terms possible, and his image was denigrated. Take, for instance, the dispute between the village of Masmiya and the Bedouin group of Wuhedat over the land of Mukhazan in the sub-district of Gaza of Gaza. And I put here two examples, one in the form of um, a telegram in Ottoman Turkish, and the other one a letter in Arabic, both of them submitted by the villagers against uh, the Bedouins. And uh, it's amazing to see a few months after the revolution, uh, after the final dethronement of Abdel Hamid, the change in the discourse against him from this mighty ruler who um, um, was described in, in, uh, as a just ruler or as a um, someone who really cared about his um, subjects to the, wor the worst possible terms one can uh, imagine. The conflict uh, in this case led to the submission of mutual complaints to Istanbul by both parties. The villagers claimed that they had cultivated the land for generations, whereas the Bedouins took possession illegally during Abdul Hamid's period and obtain fictitious deeds for the land through their connections in Gaza. The villagers castigate the Abdul Hamid area while employing the new discourse of the post-Hamidian period, a stylistic choice which was doubtless motivated by flattery. It also served as a point of reference for evaluating the new regime, which is assumed to be completely different from the former, uh, from the previous one. 
The petitioners depict the old era, the old era as one of darkness and tyranny, and the new post-revolution era as the sunshine. Hence, after the revolution, we witnessed considerable change in the vocabulary using petitions, the wording, and rhetoric. It was only natural that the familiar institution of petitioning would serve as a medium through which new discourses were negotiated. The discourse in the petitions thus shifted to focus on constitutional and civil rights, the rule of law, equity, the new age in the empire's history, the subject's rights to be protected by the rule of law, and the defects of the former system. The petitioners sought to prevent treatment contrary to the constitution in its spirit, obtain various political rights, and preserve previously granted privileges vis-a-vis -vis other groups in society or within the applying groups. And I would like to show two examples very briefly, one by five sisters from Jaffa, the daughters of uh, Ismail al-Shakr, who sent this telegraphic uh, petition in very lofty Ottoman uh, against the Waqf uh, authorities uh, in Jaffa and in Jerusalem, and really um, claimed that their constitutional rights were uh, breached by the, um, um, by the Waqf authorities. And the other one, this one by uh, Rashid Abu Khadra from Gaza, uh, from a notable family in Gaza, uh, a person who had a major fallout with his own family and complained uh, numerous times actually to uh, Istanbul about both his family and the local um, uh, authorities in Gaza. And here again, he was claiming that his constitutional rights were basically uh, violated uh, by the local regime and by his own uh, family. Uh, yet, in all those petitions, no violation of specific clauses in the new constitution was cited, and instead it was argued gen generically that certain acts violated the spirit of the new constitution and the new era in the empire. The petitioners were, for the most part, still written with the help the petitions, sorry, were for the most part still written with the help of professional petition writers. Previously, when petitioning the Sultan, this practice allowed the petitioners to submit their petitions in a way that was acceptable in the Ottoman capital by using the right flattery, jargon, justifications, and codes of expression. Their Zuhalji's sat with their makeshift sense in public spaces, and their services were used by a wide variety of petitioners in return for a fee. I, I put here just one example. There are numerous uh, images from the 19th century of uh, those pet uh, petition writers of Rukhalji's. In this case, they were approached by two uh, women um, in, the, in the street. Uh, despite the lifting of the limitations and shackles of the former system, the Rukhalji's services were still used very often. The new spirit expressed in the petitions after the revolution reflects ideas circulating in the urban centers of the empire, in the press and elsewhere, which were coached in writing by those petition writers. Whether the petitions work solely reflected the Azukhalji's knowledge, understanding, and capabilities, or whether to a certain extent it also reflected those of the petitioners themselves is an open question. Already prior to 1908, many of the petitions sent to Istanbul did not address the Sultan himself, not even, uh, even not indirectly. Yet up to 1908, the Sultan directly or through the Grand Vizier was still the addressee of numerous petitions who asked for his mercy, benevolence and kindness, intervention and ad hoc justice. In addition, it was clear to all that, his, that the Sultan stood at the head of the Ottoman system was the ultimate source of power and legitimacy and had the last word with regard to justice. After the revolution, particularly after the final dethronement of Abdul Hamid, when the new Sultan became a mere figurehead, the petitions were mostly sent to the Council of State, the Parliament, and the different ministries. Petitions became a way for Ottoman subjects to communicate directly with state bureaus and officials about administrative and bureaucratic and legal matters, and less as a way to beg for mercy and personal favor from the Sultan and his representatives. In fact, the Sultan was completely eliminated from the petitions. And we again, we have to remember that this system existed for hundreds of years. 
In a context of drastic social and political changes and upheavals in the empire, many petitions now used positivist arguments and justifications which were less common under the previous regime given the nature of sultanic rule, the limited freedom of expression and the limitation on political activity. This was much more than a change in discourse. Rather, it illustrates the transformation of petitions as an institution. The introduction of postal services and the telegraph in the second half of the 19th century made petitioning an affordable way to demand justice on the part of ordinary subjects, all the more so during the proceduralization of the legal system dating from the last quarter of the century, which made access to the regular legal apparatuses, such as the Nizamiya courts, much more expensive and complicated. The gap between legal and just was bridged by the Sultan, who served as the ultimate and sole authority between them. Once constitutional rights were framed as legal articles, the disparity between law and justice was presumably eliminated. From then on, demanding justice was in fact demanding law enforcement or legal protection of civil rights. The constitution was enacted and upheld by the state rather than by the Sultan himself, and was now the supreme guardian of the common good, which is all reflected very well in the petitions. Now, the most important development in petitions after 1908 was that many of them were much more political than before, very bluntly, very openly. At face level, one can argue that this had to do with the specific circumstances in greater Syria, such as the Zionist activity in Palestine. And remember that I work on greater Syria. And I want to show uh, one example, a petition from the summer of 1913, a, a major um, clash between the, the Jewish colonies next to Jaffa and some Arab villages around them, which led to the submission of this, this petition by dozens of Mukhtars and uh, Bedouins uh, in the region of Jaffa and in Gaza, two provinces, two sub-districts. Uh, and here, basically, they claimed that the Jewish uh, colonies were um, acting as a state within a state and violated their uh, constitutional rights and their um, um, acted against the constitution, uh, basically. Uh, so, this, but despite those specific circumstances in Greater Syria. In fact, we're talking about larger processes which were at stake, which had to do with empire-wide developments and processes. The evolution of Abdul Hamid's censorship, the awakening of political life, and the right to freely express one's opinion in public are all evident in the petition. Another major change which is, which is connected to the former is that some petitions were even published now in the press, which blossomed after Abdul Hamid's censorship was lifted a new development that changed the rules of the game uh, quite radically. And in this case, the newspaper uh, Philistine, which was published in Jaffa, uh, reported about the incident in Zanuga, published a petition by the villagers, and then in the following months, published 35 articles about this incident. It's quite unbelievable. 35 times it reported about the Zanuga incident and about the consequences of the incident. In greater Syria, the Arab press flourished under the new regime, which for all extent and purposes did not exist under Abdul Hamid, when there was also no ability to discuss political events in the press or in the parliament. Dozens of newspapers appeared within a few months, and even though most of them did not survive long, they followed the events discussed in the petitions very closely and gave them a new meaning and importance. Finally, we have to remember that petitions often serve as a barometer for social, cultural, and even political developments. One can argue that the post-1908 petitions rapid, rapidly evolved from a traditionally private or confidential mode of communication between subjects and ruler into a public vehicle for demanding constitutional and political rights, protests, and a range of demands to change the governmental, governmental policy. This constituted a step from an institution that monitored authority in a monarchy and gave legitimacy to the ruler to a practice of expressing public opinion and posting popular demands. Thank you.
Thank you very much, you all. And uh, if you stop sharing your screen, perfect. Nader, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, I collected uh, many petitions um, about 25 years ago, that is the previous century, um, from Iran's National Archives, uh, but did not know what to do with them until uh, recent developments in this field, including uh, Yuval's work. The petitions in question uh, belong to the constitutional period in Iran between 1906 to 1911. And beyond what they tell us about history from below, they have important lessons about wants, underground democratization, and decision making. As a history from below, they have potential to uh, enable us to rewrite the history of the constitutional movement. At least that's my judgment. Usually, democratization is uh in that movement has been approached through the public quest for freedom democratization by means of a constitution the growth of public sphere formal channels of politics like the legislative assembly voting and elections separation of powers party formation etc and overall in my view these constitute the global dimensions of this revolution and when it comes to the dynamics of localization of the global, the discussion is confined to Islamization of the constitution, either through the influence of the young Ottomans or from a Shiite angle through the Atabat, Atabat, cleric, Atabat clerics, uh, Khorasani and Naim. These are all in dialogue with the enlightenment in one way or another including the localized versions that I just mentioned. We know that the public had taken a big part in the constitutional movement in Iran. In fact, it was the, probably the most popular movement in the history of the Middle East up to that point. And what explains this popularity? Was it the quest for liberty? Was it the convincing Islamization of the constitution that managed to rally the public? This is a puzzle that I do not think can be answered by any of the above. Instead, let's see how the public approached the assembly in its own words. When we look at the original demands at the beginning of these orders, we notice that the public, through their clerical representatives, had asked for a house of justice in Tehran with branches in the provinces. This was certainly not a legislative assembly, even if through a series of incidents, it became the actual demand to which the Shah finally acceded. The historiography ignores this original demand and treats it as a fleeting call surpassed by more fundamental demands such as a parliament and a constitution. But when we return, when we turn to the actual public dealings with the assembly, we very much see the common perception of it as a house of justice, or what is better known in Islamic history as the Mazalem Council, the place where the public addressed its petitions and sought redress from the source of justice, which for now was the monarch, or historically has always been the monarch. As soon as the assembly was established in 1906, it was bombarded with thousands of petitions from all around Iran. Many key representatives, including the head of the assembly, thought this to be a gross misunderstanding on the part of the public and sought to discontinue the practice and finally settled on creating a commission that dealt with them without bothering the assembly too much. In practice, however, almost every session was devoted to the petitions. What did the public want? What can they tell us about the state of discontent in late Hajar Iran? There was an incredible consistency among the petitions. The ones that I have seen so far, I haven't studied all of them, and that's a project for the next three years. But what I have seen so far, um, no matter where they came from, 
he asked for outright elimination of local taxes or heavy discounts of those local taxes. This demand was accompanied with a call for an end to the abuse of local officials who enforced unjust taxes to their own benefit. They all expressed willingness to pay the central taxes in full, but not the local ones. I cannot go into detail as to the structure of taxation system and why this was the case, but they had good reasons and there was plenty of room for abuse. To assist their petitioning, the public established grassroots associations and jumans throughout Iran, hundreds of them. Tehran alone came to have 200. In provinces, the associations acted partially like houses of justice in their own right, fulfilling the original demands for houses of justice throughout Iran. About a dozen had also newspapers of their own. The most powerful ones, like Azerbaijan, Rashtan, and Zeli, received not only provincial level petitions, but people from all over Iran sent petitions to them to publicize their wants and place additional pressure on the assembly, additional to what they had already sent the assembly themselves. Through collective petitions to the assembly, gatherings in the associations and their own press, the public found its own voice, came to define its own interests and engage in a discussion of public good. This was an alternative public sphere that was not enlightenment inspired, although it inevitably came into contact with what we consider the more conventional enlightenment driven public sphere, but without, without becoming dissolved in it. Now, without discounting the enlightenment inspired public sphere or trivializing the formal democratic gains, we can certainly claim that petitioning and popular associations deepened democratization. They expanded participation substantially beyond the restrictive franchise and the limited numbers who voted. They acted as better barometers of public opinion as Yuval was also mentioning. Negotiation and bargaining through them amplified the democratic culture and attained fairer outcomes. Furthermore, the mass petitions received by the assembly boosted its claim of representation and helped tilt the balance against the monarchy. Now, as you all pointed out in the young case, there was a shift in the this time compared to the previous era. In case of Iran, I can maybe count seven, maybe there are more. Uh, what was different now was the agency behind the petitions that went from individual to collective. Now, granted, yes, there were collective petitions before, a section of the town, one village here and there, but it's incomparable to the level of uh, collective. Uh, also changed were the vehicles of delivery that now involved associations and clerics, and uh, their volume, now massive numbers, the content and form, that is from expressions of needs in differential, quote unquote, petition and response format to demands sometimes based on rights. I know you all mentioned rights, rights in the Young Turks case, and that's entirely true. In the Iranian case, sometimes based on rights. The addressee went from the Shah to the assembly, and the expectations from ruler's benevolence to bargaining with centers of power. And finally, petitions went from private to public. That is, they went from predominantly individual and meant for the Shah's eyes only to a public dialogue on the national stage. Still, we see in them remnants of the differential language of the past. We see The terms like Fadavian, Guyan, those who are ready to die for you, your admirers, or your, even your worshippers. And the imagery evoked by the circle of justice, the depiction of subjects as sheep, usurpers as wolves, Shah as the shepherd, a language that is a little too old fashioned for the Ottoman context, but not for Iran. Uh, with the duty to provide shelter or finding the secrets of prosperity in four elements held in balance, 
And when they refer to the assembly and associations as quote unquote, the newly established chain of justice, this was an implicit reference to the legend of and to the agreed when the chains reaching his palace doors were shaken. Traditionally, it was the Shah that was the shepherd in the shelter from the wolf, but gradually it was the assembly that became their shelter and the shepherd and the Shah, the wolf. In the case of Yazd, which I have uh, looked at closely, uh, we see these changes clearly. Yazd is interesting for not being Tehran, Tabriz, Rasht, and Zali, or even Esfahan, that is major centers of constitutional agitation and activity. It's a nearly ignored place. There is little discussion of it in the historiography. But for a six month period between December 1907 and June 1908, we have about 160 pages of petitions or discussions surrounding them between the assembly and the ministries. And we are very lucky to have these because they are supposed to have vanished in the assembly's bombardment in the summer of 1908. Luckily, a good number remain intact at the Ministry of Archives. In this short period, we observe a surprising transformation in the province from the prime minister's haughty rejection of the public demands and threatening it and chasing after the protesters for further negotiations. The ease and clarity with which the public was, was heard at the cab of astounding, thanks mostly to the assembly. The collective negotiations nurtured the culture of democratic decision-making with clear results and fairer outcomes. This included a full year cancellation of tax, of local taxes, substantial reductions in the future years, dismissal of the governor and detested tax officials and installment of publicly favored administrators. The Yaz Association in Tehran and more importantly, the Tabriz Association and the popular press helped publicize their message nationally. And for the first time on record, Yaz found its publics negotiating amongst themselves and equally importantly, as a province with Tehran. The bombardment of the assembly 15 days from the last telegram did not mute Yaz's sense of empowerment. Weaving the public's desperate concerns together beyond the ever present unease about taxes, the larger project intends to recover the collective vision of public good, a just society and nation, uh, while coming to terms with the regional variations. Their archaic appearances, writes the historical sociologist Zaret, belie the historical significance of petitioning for the origins of democracy, invention of public opinion, and a precedent for the people's public use of their reason. The associations had a variety of alternatives before them, but could not remain as before. As voluntary unpaid bodies with close ties to the legislature, extensive executive responsibilities, and with a hand in the judiciary, they needed a better defined role under the doctrine of separation of powers. And between state and civil society, they had a number of alternatives. On the statist side, they could acquire a role akin to the administrative councils of the Ottoman Empire that channeled local concerns, or they could turn into elected provincial legislatures. On the civil society side, they could shed official responsibilities, retain, retain their purely voluntary character, and act as an ideal intermediary between citizens and government. Possible were also a variety of compromises in between. As noted by Shapiro and Markov, popular sovereignty, this is a very important point, popular sovereignty is not one and the same with parliamentary sovereignty. And the French revolutionary government, with its decision to discontinue local grievance notebooks considered here as petitions, fundamentally changed the nature of representation by closing off an alternative channel for expression of local concerns. Lamenting that loss, they point to hopeful signs in recent alternative democratic developments around the globe that complement the work of legislature for better expression of local wants. Now, my last 
paragraph, let me come to a little bit to the contemporary period. Despite the short life of the constitutional movement, the associations uh, managed to introduce the modern decentralization idea. Two movements in the North grew out of the organizational remnants of two sturdy associations, namely the decentralizing Jangal and Khiyabani movements in Gilan and Azerbaijan. Rasht and Tabriz associations had managed to act as independent local governments for a brief period. And the later decentralist movements displayed an unmistakable affinity with their former selves in membership, institutional memory, and constitutional rhetoric. This afterlife of the constitutional movement has been unexplored. And with the revival of decentralization debate in contemporary Iran against central authoritarianism, the overlooked connections demand revaluation. The recent debates have taken as their starting point the 1907 association laws, raising the prospect of petitioning and associations as indigenous alternative democratic possibilities in future Iran alongside the legislative assembly. Thank you, Nader. And uh, now we will have Sarpil with us to comment and maybe raise a couple of questions for our uh, panelists. Sarpil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank everyone uh, who is involved in organizing this event, and especially Dr. Balta Jolda Bremer for um, inviting me to be a part of this great panel. Um, I really enjoyed reading uh, both papers and my comments are going to be based on those full papers that not everyone uh, got to uh, read. So in the last two decades, scholars have started to pay more attention to the connections between the constitutional revolutions in the Ottoman Empire um, and Iran. Accordingly, there has been an increase in the number of studies that not only explore the interactions and the cooperation between Ottoman and Iranian revolutionaries, but also compare the constitutional experiences of Ottomans and Iranians. Although that is not the goal of the papers presented today, when considered together, they actually contribute to our understanding of Ottoman and Iranian constitutionalism in relation to each other, as they both deal with changes in petitions and petitioning um, in the context of constitutional politics. Petitions have a long history in both the Ottoman Empire and in Iran, and they are very valuable both as sources and topics of study because they have served different functions for the state and society um, for a very long time. Um, but first and foremost, in Linda Darling's words, um, petitions served as an unspoken contract between the ruler and the ruled, in which the ruler supplied justice protection and benefits, while the rules supplied submission, support, and legitimacy. Therefore, the changes um, that have been studied by both scholars here in the petitioning practices can illustrate how the nature of the relationship between the ruler and the ruled changed during the constitutional period. And again, as both scholars acknowledge, Petitions also serve as barometers for public opinion and thus give us insights into people's um, views and attitudes regarding contemporary events and issues. Not only do they shed new light on the lives, concerns, and problems of the masses um, during this transformational period, but they also make ordinary people's voices heard. Employing this diverse but underutilized body of sources, these papers advance our understanding of everyday politics in the Ottoman Empire and Iran during the constitutional period. Um, ben Basad's work demonstrates how the change in the political system transformed the institution of petitioning in the Ottoman Empire based on petitions from Palestine between 1908 and 1914. On the other hand, Sohrabi's work explores 
um, the public's contribution to the democratization of Iranian politics through an analysis of petitions from Yaz between December 1907 and June 1908. Despite the fact that their focus, approach, and goals differ, um, both scholars reach the same conclusion about the practice of petitioning under constitutional rule, that it changed in visible and significant ways. And I just want to mention um, those four changes both scholars observe um, in their research. First, the petitions were not addressed to the Shah or the Sultan anymore. Instead, they were addressed to the assembly in Iran or to the Council of the State, the, the Council of State, the Parliament, or the different ministries in the Ottoman Empire, mostly eliminating the Sultan and the Shah from the petitioning process. Second, rather than asking for the Sultan's or the Shah's mercy and benevolence, as they traditionally did, petitioners started um, demanding their rights and sometimes in an aggressive tone um, based on the constitution, the law, and the principle of equality. Third, petitions that used to be read only by a small number of government officials started to become public um, as they were published in newspapers and even mentioned in the debates that took place in the parliament, enabling people's complaints and demands to be discussed on the national stage. And fourth, petitioning became more political and more collective with the involvement of different actors in the petitioning process, um, such as the political activists, urban groups in Palestine, and clerics and popular associations in Yazd. These changes are significant since they indicate people's awareness of the administrative and legal changes that were introduced by the constitutional regime, as well as their attempt and ability to use those changes to their own advantage. Far from being ignorant or indifferent, <clears throat> people in Palestine and Yaz deployed the language of the new regime in their communications with government officials. And they used petitions to resist and modify policies, to renegotiate their positions, to defend and protect their interests, and therefore to have a voice in decision-making. This is even more significant, I think, in the, uh, in the case of the Ottomans, since the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 was not um, a grassroots movement like the Iranian Revolution. The petitions discussed in these papers revealed the multifaceted, complex, and nuanced nature of the relationship between the masses and the political authorities. They also give us clues about ordinary people's perceptions and expectations of the constitutional regime, a very important but largely neglected aspect of um, Ottoman and Iranian constitutionalism. Overall, these papers allow us to see how ordinary people helped shape constitutional politics and discourse in both the Ottoman Empire and in Iran. And by restoring people's roles as historical actors, they contribute to the writing of the history of Iranian and Ottoman constitutionalism from below. There are a couple of issues that I would like to um, address in, in both papers. Ben Fassad's paper discusses the petitioning system, mostly from the perspective of the petitioners in the constitutional period, and not so much from the perspective of the representatives of the states. Although it compares the petitions of the constitutional period with those of the 19th century, in terms of their addressee, content, style, and tone, it does not fully explain how their function changed for those in charge under the constitutional regime, which can help us better understand the workings of the constitutional government and its relations with the people in the provinces. 
And while Sohrabi's paper um, discusses what he calls the convergence of the global formal and the local popular aspects of democracy in constitutional I Iran, it's not um, fully clear how the political, social, and economic developments of the pre-constitutional period paved the way for the convergence of these two arenas. There are several questions that can be asked uh, to both presenters, and I'm sure particip our participants um, have their own questions. But here I would like to ask the same two-part question um, to our presenters to kind of like highlight, uh, once again, the similarities and differences between the constitutional experiences uh, of Ottomans and Iranians. So the first part of the, co uh, the question is, what do these petitions tell us about the governments and the people's perception of, sorry, understanding of citizenship in the constitutional period? The issue of citizenship comes up in both papers, like very briefly, um, but I think they, like this issue deserves further discussion, um, considering we're talking about people demanding their rights and making reference to the constitution and, and equality. And second, which is also related to the issue of citizenship, how did constitutionalism change the way traditionally marginalized groups used petitioning during this time period? Um, I know that there are a few references to women and, and Jews uh, in Ben Basad's paper, and there are there is a reference to Zoroastrians in, in Sokrabi's paper. So I'm wondering if they see a significant change in the way these like minorities use petitioning during this time um, or not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serpin. These are very thought-provoking questions. I cannot wait, wait to hear. Um, what you all and Nader have to say. And you all and Nader, um, please go ahead, uh, whomever wants to speak more to add, uh, first to address uh, Sarpil's questions. And then we will open the floor to the questions and comments from the audience. Um, regarding the, um, the, 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 first of all, thank you for, for, for the comments. I also wrote a few things when another was, was talking. Um, regarding the bureaucratic process that the petitions uh, went through, it's very much uh, like in the Abdul Hamid's era. It's, it's a technical um, procedure, only that previously um, some of the petitions reach the um, sultan and from there were referred to the to the different ministries but practically it's the same process um, in most cases during abdul hamid the grand vizier got the petitions and from there referred the issue to the relevant ministries whether it was the ministry of the interior the ministry of justice and so on and there was a routine procedure um, to handle the petitions, by the way, very efficient and very every 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 petition was handled. In in most cases, it was a bureaucratic correspondence asking the relevant um, uh, relevant uh, uh, district or uh, or sub district for uh, to look into the matter and to report back and. In most cases, that was about it. I mean, we hardly see something uh, beyond that. So, in, in terms of the process, the bureaucratic process, it's pretty much the same. I don't, I don't see many changes, despite the fact that the sultan was eliminated. That's that's the major change. Um, in terms of uh, subaltern groups, um, it's a very good question because, question because I, I, in my book, I wrote about many subaltern groups that, that uh, used petitioning during Abdul Hamid's period, period. Bedouins, villagers, um, foreigners, um, who were arrived without anything, without property, like refugees, uh, stuff like this. And, and I still see that uh, during um, 
during uh, the, the post-1908 uh, uh, period. But it seems that um, it seems that we we have a change here because, as I said, we have many more um, political issues, um, many more uh, communal petitions by groups, like we saw the, the group of villagers who um, uh, submitted something together, and that was reported in the press and followed by political activists in Jaffa. So the change, I would say, is in this term. For example, the clashes between the Zionist settlers and, and uh, villagers was followed uh, by the press all over Palestine, uh, was discussed in the parliament, was uh, raised by political activists uh, in the towns. So there is the, the place where I see the change, the, the political component that was given to the petitions. But I don't see, for example, you know, more Serb alterns petitioning the, than before or something of that nature. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. I was so concerned about the time, I forgot even to thank the uh, organizers. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the questions. Um, uh, as far as, uh, you know, pre and post comparisons, pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary comparisons, we're in a very bad position in the Iranian context because um, we have very few petitions from that period. We know it was very common. Uh, we, we read about it in the, in the memoirs and uh, advices to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the king and you know, all kinds of stuff, literature. Um, but uh, Irene Schneider, as far as I know, has the only study of uh, pre-constitutional, of, of, uh, of pre-constitutional petitions in the Iranian context. And even then, the 2,000 or 3,000 or so microfilm petitions uh, from that period, Nasruddin Shah period, um, had been lost according to her. And she was able to manage uh, to uh, find 120 of them and, and, and do her study. So we really don't have much to compare. I have the feeling that there's a lot more somewhere. And also, um, also those microfilm, that microfilm will, will, will also turn up one way or another. Um, but short of that, um, I mean, going to, into that description, long description, um, as far as the bureaucratic procedures, uh, from what we can gather from uh, Schneider's study is that there is a commission um, that reviews these and brings, uh, brings them to the Shah's attention and then decides what cases are to go to the Sharia court and what cases are to be uh, dealt with by the Shah. And this is very interesting when you, when you quote them and, and, and look at them closely is that the Sharia courts are, are concerned with cases of divorce, inheritance, financial disputes between individuals. And whenever it comes to the issue of taxes or oppression of officials, that's a matter that is dealt with in the court of Mazana. And uh, we see that reflected in the life of Majlis, that when people refer to Majlis, it's, it's about taxes, it's about oppression of officials. Uh, it's not about these personal matters, it's not about disputes over inheritance, uh, this and that. Although there is, there is a case of inheritance actually with, 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 with uh, the J Jewish community, that they have a convert to Islam that is uh, trying to usurp the inheritance of all others claiming to be Muslim. And that creates a lot of uh, tension and conflict between the local clerics and the uh, majlis that is pressuring for the rights of, of the minority group and the local clerics who are resisting that. So we do have that, um, but that's an exception. Um, and, and obviously is a, is, a, is a political question, is a, of a political nature, it's a question about the rights of all citizens and, uh, and matters of the like. Um, with respect to the post-constitutional period, you know, I had studied these uh, 
just movement through the parliamentary debates and um, and and uh, knew that the assembly is is pursuing them is sending them to the to the to the uh, various ministries and all i didn't know how many of them were written to the shah how do they continue to address the shah or not and how they dealt with it when i went looking at yazd um i was shocked to first of all find out that it looks like there are very few petitions or any longer written to the Shah. And this is hap happening completely voluntarily. In the Ottoman case, uh, I know they had to ban writing of petitions to the Sultan. It happened partially, naturally, but there, were, there, were, there was very, a lot of concern about uh, petitions still going to the Sultan. And they uh, publicly announced that this should be discontinued. In the Iranian case, um, that does not seem to be the case. And that is making the Shah very paranoid. It's making him very angry. During the uh, counter-revolutionary movement, he sets up a telegram machine of its own amongst the counter-revolutionary crowds so they can petition him in competition with the assembly and hence grant him legitimacy as opposed to the assembly. And the assembly does not forward any petitions to the Shah. They, uh, as, the as, the, as the legislature, they are dealing with the executive and hence the ministers. But what was surprising was the extent, the, the length to which they went to communicate with the ministers, each and every one of these petitions. I mean, especially important ones, I guess the case of Yaz was very important for them. So I was shocked to see that every request was sent to them, an answer was expected, was communicated back, which doesn't mean that all the way the majlis, the assembly took the side of the petitioners. No, um, it was in a very tricky position. It had to balance the taxation needs of the state versus the public cries of injustice. If it went to, against the public, it would lose legitimacy, it would lose its support against the monarchy. If it did away with the issue of taxes and granted what everybody wanted on the ground, the state, the bankrupt state, would be left with even less money than it already had. And one of its reformist agendas was to actually uh, correct the taxes. So it was in a kind of a funny position, but the extent to which it pressured them, pressured the ministers to answer them um, was um, truly astounding. I, I think my connection is a little unstable, but I, I hope not too much. Um, okay, I, 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 I cut it here. Yeah, yeah. sometimes you just throw, freeze for maybe like one or two seconds, but then it comes back. So uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't really bad. We were able to uh, follow you neither. Uh, so now I would like to open the floor. And can I can I add just one more thing regarding sure. Zoroastrians sure. because it sure. came up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the Zoroastrians, it's a very interesting issue because it's also a barometer of the of the minorities in the Iranian context. Um, uh, and Yazd is, is a place where you have a, a lot of Zoroastrians, and all this talk about uh, alternative public sphere. Um, non in, affected by the enlightenment and all that uh, should not be taken as glorification of it. Um, should not be taken as something that could surpass the enlightenment sphere. No, it's just that it's there, it's in dialogue with it, um, but there is not necessarily anything superior about it. And when we come to the Zoroastrians in Yaz, for example, we see that clearly. Um, that they are very much against the notion of equality with uh, religious minorities, with the Zoroastrians, for example. They, when when, when uh, a, a, a famous Zoroastrian Parvis, the merchant is killed in uh, Yaz, um, the association write to Tehran that why are you killing yourself over this uh, fire worshiper? Also Muslims were killed. Why aren't you concerned with their cause, with their, is, is, is there is the blood of a 
uh, fire worshiper, more pure than a pure Muslim, on and on. And later during the second period, the uh, association members refused to participate in the single Zoroastrianist present. So this notion of equality is coming up in fact, independently within the Iranian context, but it concerns the issue of taxes. It concerns the issue of khas and om, the issue of the select and the public, that these should be treated equally and on the same ground. While with religious minorities, for example, that's something that they could, they could benefit a good deal from the Enlightenment discourse. Thank you. So now I would like to open the floor for questions and comments. As I mentioned, you can either raise your hand using the raise hand function and uh, speak, or you can send your question to me either directly in the chat or also anonymously to my uh, message box. We already have a question uh, from Sumeya Kojaman who says that uh, she lost her voice so she cannot speak, but I'm going to read her question on her behalf. She says that, and I'm reading, I'm curious about the periods when there's increased and de decreased interest in petitioning also in the context of availability of archival material. Is it possible that they, in the early modern era, there was a period of high petitioning, but we don't know about it because the system was different, the documents are lost, etc. Is it possible that increased petitioning doesn't reflect democratization? Maybe by the ch changes in the land law or economic nationalist propaganda, violence increased and hence the need to reach out for help increased. Um, thank you for this question. At least in the Ottoman Empire, um, from the 16th century until the early 19th century, we have books of complaints, and um, in those uh, notebooks, hundreds of them, answers to petitions were uh, uh, kept in Istanbul. And we don't have the originals, they were not uh, saved, but we have the um, summary of the petition and then how it was dealt, the answer that was given to the petition. So we can see that, um, by the way, not nobody really worked on those shikayat deftelehi, just uh, a few researchers beginning to, to appear. Um, but uh, for example, for, for uh, one study of one year, one shikayat deftelehi of one year that was conducted, we have almost 3000 petitions that were collected within nine months. So it's, at least in the Ottoman case, uh, un, unlike what uh, Nadir said a minute ago about uh, uh, the scarcity of, of uh, petitions in, uh, in, the, in the Iranian case, at least in the Ottoman case, we have, it's, it's an institution that existed for hundreds of years, where, and we're talking about thousands of petitions uh, every year that was that were received in the uh, imperial imperial center. Uh, so in that case, a lot of petitions doesn't necessarily reflect anything uh, that has to do with democratization. It's something that existed. People used it. Villagers, Bedouins, urbanites, guilds. Everybody was minorities. Everybody was using the petitioning system. Um, in terms of um, um something about tension that was asked in, in, in I can say that in the Ottoman Empire, that is something that, that is really interesting. But following 1908, the fact that it came after Abdul Hamid's long reign and quite um with all the censorship and all the um ban on political activity and all and all of that. The fact that suddenly this disappeared caused a lot of uh, tensions within groups, within minority groups, within um, um, ethnic groups, and also between the communities themselves. So the fact that suddenly people could talk, could act politically, could write in the press, could talk in the parliament, could petition freely, uh, could 
create organizations, civil society organizations, something that was banned uh, under Abdul Hamid. So within a year or two, we have this, um, um, I can say like, um, um, we have a mess in Ottoman society. Everybody is, is against everybody, like uh, within communal groups and between the groups themselves. That's, that's a very, uh, very interesting uh, development that we see prior to World War I. Nader, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, of course, the absence of petitions or increase in volume by themselves uh, cannot mean anything. Um, as I mentioned with the Iranian case, uh, we don't have that many petitions, but we know how important it is through these uh, various tracts. Um, Shah, for example, takes pictures of himself uh, that he's eating lunch and somebody is reading him petitions. Uh, that's kind of a mechanism of legitimacy that, you know, I'm, I'm so concerned about my subjects that I'm spending every minute of my day, including eating time, to listen to your petitions. And uh, we have, you know, boxes of justice established throughout Iran. We have various attempts, but we don't have those petitions. Um, however, there are periods and cases where we can say that uh, it's uh, the increase in volume, you know, first of all, it's massive. And two, there, is, there are qualitative transformations that speak the language of the times, you know, that there's a, this very uh, kind of a sense that these are different times, the expectations are very high. In the Ottoman case, from the day of the revolution, you have the old regime and the new regime, Debre Sabek, you know, the next day, July 11th, with your Debre Sabek, Abdul Hamid's time is, you know, the old regime, and now you're in the new regime time. In Iran, it's not as abrupt, but eventually it also comes that people are, keep referring to that the uh, age of tyranny is gone and the age of justice is now upon us. We expect this, we expect that. Um, and all these, uh, you know, explanations that I gave, I think are good indications that this is a very different time and the petitioning are at the center of it. And besides, if the public was not familiar with petitioning, how is it that all of a sudden uh, it's coming to the fore in this massive way? So, uh, you know, we need to do a better job in the Iranian history and find that. Um, also, um, Sarpil, you are also an expert in, in the Iranian and Ottoman constitutionalism. Please feel free whenever you would like to answer or add to a question. Thank you. So we have another question from Felix, and I'll read it. Um, the MENA region is quite under-researched and neglected in the concept of criminal underworlds. Um, in a graduate paper, I found Philistine as a rich source for an under-organized crime. Some of the writings resemble, according to German scholar Evelyn Deiroff, petitioning. I'm not following very well what's going on here, but maybe you are better than I am. <laughs> You, you all, Ben Bastard, spoke about this phenomenon too in your presentation. In which extent did the both of you find evidence for organized crime, criminal activities, and corruption in Palestine, uh, Palestine, Israel, and or Iran? So, um, first of all, Palestine is a great source, and it's available online uh, together with some other newspapers that were published after 1908. We don't have newspapers under Abdel Hamid. With the exception of the Jewish community in Palestine, for some reason, we know we can discuss it, but for some reason, um, uh, Abdel Hamid let four or five Jewish newspapers uh, operate uh, during his reign. And we have a lot of information about criminal activity in Hebrew newspapers and then in Arabic newspapers after 1908. Um, there are a lot of petitions about criminal activity, also from the Hamidian period. I, I write about it extensively in my book. Uh, often many of the petitions are about criminal activity, about 
complaining about um, insecure regions, complaining that the Ottoman local authorities doesn't don't protect the um, civilians, don't do enough to to fight criminal activity. Uh, sometimes we have complaints about specific people, about uh, uh, someone who is blamed for doing a criminal activity and the authorities don't uh, arrest him uh, and so on. So it's, it's a very good uh, source. Um, I try to remember off the top of my head if uh, I saw something about criminal activity after 1908. I can't recall specifically, but 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 it must be there. I mean, I'm quite sure we have it also after 1908. So I have a question, if I may, while waiting, if anybody else from the audience uh, would like to raise a question. Um, so considering the fact that these, okay, first of all, I'm an early modernist. Of course, the, these are not my... Um, comfort zones, but I'm really interested in expanding my horizon. Considering the fact that the revolutionary periods are significantly short in both cases, and the change in terms of the language used in petitions is stark, from talking about the benevolence of the Sultan or the Shah to demanding uh, the just demanding justice because it is right. I am curious, if this is actually a sign of genuine increase in terms of the awareness of people now they have rights or is this some type of like a pre-forma since they are still using Arzuhal Jilar to write these petitions that there is now a new template that is being used in these petitions and the people who are writing these petitions are just using this template instead of an older template that was referring to the Sultan or the Shah, rather than actually talking about the, the people who have the who were the complaining ones really experiencing this shift very quickly, particularly in the provinces further away regions like Philistine or Yazd. That's a very good question. I, I said in my talk that um, it's an open question whether it's only the Azukhajis who uh, Azukhajiler who um, um, caught this uh, change and, and uh, started using it in petitions or whether it was uh, something much more broader. I actually think that it was broader. The Azukhajis were used as, as a way to um, write the petitions and submit them to, to Istanbul. But I think if I, I can, in my paper, I quote uh, Michelle Campus, she called the constitution a sacred text that people actually cited, like uh, learned it as a sacred text. Um, I think it was part of a much broader or larger process. I mean, this whole issue of political activity and uh, civil society organizations and newspapers and parliament and elections. Uh, so people participated in, in this process, even if not everybody, then at least some participated in, participated in it. And although they used the Azukhaljis, I think they got some sense of this new era and uh, a new rights and, and, and stuff like this. So it's it's not just the Azukhaljis. I think something much broader was taking place and, and, and people participated in that to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, my impression is that uh, also it's a mixture. Um, it's uh, both genuine and also manipulative. Uh, that you know you in the Balkans for example you see these petitions from these bandits coming in saying that oh they're criminal active or, or prisoners actually a lot of prisoners in Istanbul petitioned oh all, all our bad bad deeds were done under the dark uh, atmosphere of the old regime now that uh, we have the age of justice um, Please free us 
and we'll do better. And it wasn't us that uh, is to be is to be blamed, but the old regime at dark atmosphere is is at fault. So you do have that. You have people not paying um, fares for the for the for the for the ships for the boats, saying there's liberty. Um, there are taxes stop flowing to the center in, 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 in Anatolia. It's a big problem in the name of liberty. Now there's liberty. Um, so there is, there is, of course, manipulation, but there is also a, a growing sense about, about, about rights. And you can also say that about the Iranian context. Thank you. Uh, we have Leila. Leila, I'm going to uh, unmute you and then you can ask your question. Are you able to unmute yourself? Perfect. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you for this, this is so uh, so great. So my question is related actually to um, what uh, Aisha just asked and, and, and what you answered. I was wondering, um, do you notice a, a change uh, in the language of petition, especially looking at these provincial uh, petitions from smaller groups uh, that reflects these uh, uh, changes in the way, not just in terms of, uh, you know, constitutionalism or, you know, new political power centers in a sense, you know, the majlis rather than the, the, the Shah, but uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with the Ottoman context, obviously, uh, that language that uses these uh, I could say tropes but you know formulaic uh, new formulaic uh, address or standards um, in the Ottoman context it's, it's very much like oh the civilized governments and, and things like this uh, is there a change uh, like that and one can only see that when one reads <laughs> gazillions of petitions right is there a change like that 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 shows this um, that, that the petitioners are actually following this language and trying to appeal to these sort of major claims uh, of the people they're petitioning. Uh, does associational uh, life has have much to do with it, like in the Ottoman case? And I'm asking this for the Iranian case, for Yaz, for example. Uh, even in the non-political context, when, when, the, uh, when the petitions are not necessarily a sort of strictly political nature. Um, that was a question for me or for you all? Zayla, was that a question for me or for you all? Sorry, I was not, I wasn't unmuted. Yes, uh -huh. for you, for the Iranian, for the Iranian could you, could you, I'm, could I'm just thinking comparatively yeah. with the Ottoman yeah, uh, yeah. situation. Could you, could you could you repeat the question again? Could you? So is there is there a change in language even in in the non political context that that in the petitions that reflects uh, these these claims? Uh, and, and I just gave an example of the Ottoman, the, the civilized governments uh, and civilized world and things like this. Uh, even when is... the when the petitions are not directly political well non-political petitions i don't really come across you know um if they're written to the assembly uh, they they are of a political nature um you don't you don't come across non-political you know, so or you know it, maybe there are but i haven't seen any and i haven't i have a mass of petitions i haven't gone through so um, I'll let you know at a later time, uh, but there is a very palpable uh, sense that the language is different, even when you compare them to the few that, that uh, Schneider has at her disposal, um, and she has she also provides a Persian uh, transcription. Um, the changes are massive, uh, very very different, and and, and very political, and the. Uh, Arzohal Jiz in the Iranian context, they are operative. You know, you do see kind of the standard format, you know, with Arize at the top written in a very kind of a fancy uh, way. Um, but they become, uh, the public takes over somehow, you know, they're writing their own petitions. 
and addressing it directly to the to the assembly, and they're not going to the standard format of the Arizegs or the or the Arizer writers. Uh, Uh, that are uh, think, uh, themselves in their own in their own way. We are losing you Good. more often now, Nader. I don't know if it is about your connection. Um, but um, so I think this is going to be the last question. It is from Hadel, who is actually my undergraduate student. Thank you, Hadel, for being here. And she asks, were any petitioners in prison for speaking poorly of the government? Or was punishment subjected to those who only publicly criticized the high taxes arrested by high or uh, collected arrested by high authorities? I know you mentioned abuse by officials. So I'm wondering what were the consequences for those who complained about the abuses in their pet petitioning? Can I answer that? Um, I haven't seen any. Um, you know, there's something sacred about petitions. You know, my, that's my sense that they are to be taken very necessary that you take it very seriously, answer everything, but you don't turn around and punish somebody for uh, having the guts to complain from local oppression um, simply because that's the function of the petitions. That's, that's, what, that's, that, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's, what, that's how you're using them. However, if locally, uh, people find out that you are writing petitions and you're in a weak position, of course, it's dangerous. Uh, but never, I, I don't think ever the center um, would, would, would want to pursue anything of the sort against the petition writer, either in the Ottoman context or the Iranian context. But um, there's a lot of safeguards taken, for example, in the Iranian context, I know, to make sure that there are people who are not preventing petitioners from petitioning the source of justice, that there are ways of making sure that they have the liberty to do so uh, and, 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 and without fear of the locality. Okay. Also in the Ottoman case, it, it's um, I think quite remarkable that um, People complained, even in small villages, small, small towns. People complained, and, and I think uh, it was quite risky sometimes to if you complain about the governor, and then he found out that, that you complained about him uh, could have con consequences. But still, people still complain throughout Ottoman history, and um, I know from my work in Gaza that sometimes. Uh, when uh, one uh, group or one family or one coalition complained, it has consequences because uh, the other group or the other uh, uh, coalition reacted and, and sometimes there was a lot of tension in the city. But uh, still we see complaints from all over the empire by various groups. Um, and I, I think it didn't change after 1908. It continued in a very similar way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we are at the end of our event and time-wise, you all led wonderfully. Thank you so much. And it's almost two. Uh, and I mean, in the East Coast. And thank you so much for joining us, Sarpil, Nader, and you all. It was a pleasure to listen to you and to learn from you. And uh, Ottoman Turkey Studies Initiative and Iranian Studies Initiative are going to be here with uh, other events that we are in the making of. Uh, just uh, be on the lookout and visit our websites and also social media accounts for the upcoming events. We look forward to seeing you in our other events throughout the academic year. Uh, and have a wonderful evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.